Okay, guys, it's 12 o'clock, and welcome to Cancer Center Grand Rounds. Uh, a couple of announcements. Um, just in case anyone didn't know, next Wednesday, the uh, Cancer Center Grant will be reviewed uh, by 28 of our closest friends um, from around the country who will be joining us for the site visit. We'll be having our site visit up at, uh, at Betts House and the Greenberg Center. And I want to thank all the members of the Cancer Center who have worked so hard um, to put together what I think is really a terrific presentation and something which I hope will be received uh, warmly um, by the site visitors. So thank you to everyone for, uh, for that. The second thing to announce is next week's Grand Rounds, we have a special visitor who's coming all the way from University College London. Uh, Dr. Chris Boshoff will be giving Grand Rounds uh, next uh, next uh, week. Chris is the Cancer Center Director of University College London. Uh, he works in a number of different areas, including DNA repair, also including the area of bladder cancer. Um, he, d he directs a diverse research group at UCL uh, and has been a, a terrific partner with the Yale-UCL relationship. And he'll be here as well to, uh, to participate uh, in the site visit. We've asked him to give Grand Rounds, uh, so we look forward to hearing from Chris on um, on uh, Tuesday of next week. So we now, this week, have our regular uh, format of Grand Rounds, and we have two spectacular speakers. Uh, the second speaker will be James Yu. James is from the uh, Department, of Therapeutic uh, Department of Therapeutic Radiology here at Yale, and he'll be talking to us about prostate cancer and bending of the cost curve. Our first speaker is Dr. Donald Engelman, uh, who is a Higgins professor of MBMB. Uh, Dr. Engelman, I was just saying to him, Dr. Engelman was a was an established senior professor when I was a college student. And then Dr. DeMeo came up and he said, Tom, Dr. Engelman was an established senior professor when I was a college student too. So Dr. Engelman's been an established senior professor of MBMB for a long time, and we're delighted to have him today uh, talking to us about uh, tumor targeting and drug delivery using the, uh, the uh, PHLIP peptide. Dr. Engelman. Thanks, Doc. Am I live? Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's been a really wonderful experience becoming engaged with the Cancer Center and, and forming some collaborative relationships, and uh, most of them I won't have time to talk about. Um, my aim today is to tell you about a peptide that we discovered by accident. I'll tell you a little about the accident, but it is kind of a story that uh, you might think of as a, uh, a model for why the NIH invests in basic science, or at least if it actually turns out to be practically useful, you might think that. Um, so I'm a biophysicist and have been, as you just heard for a while. Uh, and so it was really quite a surprise to me after working on abstract issues having to do with molecular properties that I found myself working on these. Uh, I, I've learned this is a mouse, and uh, I know a lot about them now. Uh, that's the front end, that's the back end. Uh, <laughs> and the um, uh, this mouse has, has a, um, a tumor in it, and when we inject the peptide I'll tell you about, uh, either IV or IP, it goes around and targets the tumor. So here's the peptide in its fluorescent labeled form. And so that's pretty much the message. You can leave now or you can stay and I'll tell you some more details. Um, so the, the, the kind of operative question that we've come to uh, bear down on is, is whether acidity can be a useful biomarker for tumors. As we know, uh, many biomarkers have been used to target tumors, and the general experience is that, uh, here's the case of Herceptin, the general experience is that uh, they do produce a benefit, but the benefit is modest. Uh, viewed in terms of long-term survival. So compared with chemotherapy alone, Herceptin increases average survival by about five months. Well, that's valuable, and, and, but one, what one hopes for is more. But then we might ask, well, why is it that this curve goes down that way? What is it about tumors that, uh, that they 
such that they become resistant to something that, in this case, binds to a surface receptor. And the answer, at least part of the answer, appears to be that real tumors are quite heterogeneous, and they express whatever the marker is at varying levels um, in different cells in the tumor. And so you apply whatever the targeting molecule and therapy is of your choice, and it, it gets all the cells that express a suitable level of that marker, but then the rest of the cells continue to grow and the tumor eventually recurs and, and um, with the result that the curve goes down. Um, so the question on the table is whether acidity might be something that could be targeted. Um, tumors are acidic and they're acidic for a basic reason having to do, or a set of basic reasons, having to do with their physiology. So this is a marker that can't be selected against except by not being, uh, by converting to a non-tumor phenotype. So selection seems unlikely. And the peptide we've discovered is a way to target acidity. So the reason for being interested in this is, I think, that it's a different route to target tumors based essentially on their physiology. What is that physiology? Well, one basic property is that tumors are often growing too fast for their oxygen supply, or trying to, and so the result is that the, uh, the lack of oxygen puts them into anaerobic respiration. They use the glycolytic pathway that you all know very well, and uh, yes, I could examine you on it, but I won't. Um, and the, and, and the, the cytoplasm becomes acidic, and the cells pump the acid out to maintain their uh, physiological balance. That means that the environment gets acidified. The other, uh, another major contributor is that um, cancer cells take up glucose very avidly, as probably most of you know, and uh, the result is that they tend to overwhelm the capacity of their mitochondria, and the result is that even in the presence of oxygen, uh, the glycolytic pathway gets used a lot, acidity is produced. And furthermore, many tumor cells express carbonic anhydrases at their surface to deal with the carbon dioxide that's produced by metabolism, and that too acidifies the local environment. So there are several contributors to acidification of the extracellular environment in a tumor. Now, we were studying protein folding, and we had the idea that you could think of the early stages of membrane protein folding in terms of uh, the formation of independently stable helices, and then their side-to-side -side interaction to initiate the uh, development of the folded state. And this turns out to still have some merit as a thought about how things emerge from the translocon, and we could have a whole other lecture here, but we won't. Uh, but a part of this idea involved the, the proposition that the individual helices in a polytopic membrane protein would be independently stable. And there are a bunch of arguments connected with that. But it set us off to test this idea. And John Hunt, when he was in the lab, uh, did it by taking the protein bacteria rhodopsin, which has seven transmembrane helices, and, um, and he took, the, took each one, put it in, the, in a peptide, mixed it with lipid in a suitable way, did a reconstitution, and indeed most of them then formed an independently stable transmembrane helix. However, the third helix, which was then called C, um, you do the same experiment, and the peptide was found largely in solution. This was a very surprising finding for a transmembrane helix. Um, 
But when we looked at the sequence, we realized that there are some carboxyl groups that are part of the transmembrane region, so we lowered the pH. And when we did that, the peptide inserted across the membrane to form a transmembrane helix. So uh, this was an interesting result that we published a while ago, and it wasn't until uh, Jana Wyshetniak and her husband Oleg Andreev joined the lab in different roles uh, that we became aware that this might have applications in, in thinking about tumor targeting. We now call these peptides FLIPS. This stands for pH low insertion peptide. I know, uh, but we get to play. Um, and so uh, here's the sequence. This is the part from bacteria rhodopsin. If we zoom in on it, we see that there are two aspartic acid groups and a somewhat buried tryptophan. This, this is very useful for following the behavior of the peptide, and we used it to investigate the process of insertion. Because it's a peptide that we synthesize, we can put groups like cysteines in different positions to uh, use chemistry of different kinds to attach ligands. Uh, lots of biophysics later. Uh, we know that uh, several things about it. We know that it is soluble in, uh, as a monomer at low concentrations in aqueous environments and that it's unstructured. Uh, if there's a membrane or a lipid bilayer present, either a, a synthetic lipid bilayer or a biological membrane or cell, um, the peptide binds pretty strongly to the surface still in an unstructured form. And if we lower the pH, it inserts across the membrane to form a transmembrane helix. And we can follow this by fluorescence. Here we see it in solution on the membrane and inserted, or we can follow it by circular dichroism, which is a measure of secondary structure. Um, here we see it unstructured in solution, unstructured on the surface, and inserted to form the transmembrane helix. Uh, this spectrum is oriented cir circular dichroism uh, from a stack of bi lipid bilayers that tells us that the orientation of this helix is in the direction perpendicular to the bilayer. Um, so some of the properties, I mentioned it's water soluble, forms a helix. I didn't mention that it's the carboxy terminus that inserts across the membrane. Um, and so it's directional insertion. It's monomeric to the extent that we can measure it uh, at low concentration in all of these states. And that's really quite remarkable. And, and it leads it, it, it a, another branch of the work is to use this as a model to study how peptides insert into membranes. Because it's extraordinary that you have a peptide that's soluble in water and that can form a transmembrane helix. Both of those things are usually, those are usually incompatible properties. Um, doesn't seem to harm cells at all. Uh, we've done a bunch of studies to look for membrane fusion events or leakage events. And when injected into mice or put into culture with cells, there doesn't seem to be any toxicity that we've yet measured. We haven't done a formal tox study yet. Um, and from the standpoint of biological, uh, its use as an agent, uh, the fact that the D-amino acid peptides work as well as the L-amino acid peptides means that it's uh, a couple of things. One is it means that it can't be receptor driven or have, have anything to do with specific interactions with anything in the cell because the D-amino acid peptide shouldn't do that, but the L-amino acid peptide does. And it's also more stable, one thinks, in circulation. Um, so I'm going to say a few words now about how it works, what the mechanism is. Um, by doing kinetic studies, we were able to show um, the that the helix forms fast. It's a very difficult experiment to do uh, rapid kinetic studies using circular dichroism. It's very easy using fluorescence. 
So we follow it both by the CD signal and the fluorescence signal. Uh, these lines are actually fits of an explicit model. They aren't just multiple exponential fits. Um, and we get time constants. And notice that this is really pretty slow. So this is on the seconds, many tens of seconds time scale to, for the insertion event. But the helix formation goes fast. So it forms a helix on the surface and then inserts. If we go the other way by jumping, this was for jumping the pH from eight to four, so from uh, two toward acidity. If we jump away from acidity, then the helix unfolds and emerges pretty much with similar time constants. So it's a different pathway. And we've developed some molecular fantasies about what might be going on, uh, and we're trying to test them. But basically, the idea is, once again, you start here, you form a helix, and then somehow it winds up slowly as a transmembrane helix. Uh, we've also done a lot of um, what's, called, what's been called protein abuse. Um, we, we've, muted, we've done a lot of uh, alterations of the sequence. Um, I'm just going to focus on these two positions. These are the two carboxyl groups that we think are most uh, principally involved in the insertion event. Uh, and when we insert, when we change them to K, that's lysine, uh, the K flip with two lysines doesn't insert. We change them to asparagine, once again, doesn't insert. We change them to alanine, um, we, ne we never get to know because the peptide aggregates for some reason that we still don't particularly understand. Um, except that maybe the charge or the polarity of the aspartic acids helps to keep it soluble. Um, so we think that the mechanism uh, involves the protonation of carboxyl groups, um, and uh, that triggers insertion by rendering those groups more hydrophobic once they've, the charge is removed by adding a proton. Um, and interestingly, when we substituted with glutamic acid, it worked fine, but it changed the pK of insertion. So that. Uh, and subsequent experiments have shown that we can tune the peptide to different acidity levels, and that could be clinically important for targeting tumors successfully. Uh, and here's an experiment um, in which uh, the different variants were tried, uh, the one with lysines and the one with asparazine, shown, shown here and here, uh, with psi. Uh, 5.5, a, a dye that emits in the infrared uh, fluorescence, has infrared fluorescence, uh, targets the tumors if it's flip, but does not target them if we change these groups. So it's nothing about the binding of the peptide or something like that, we think. Uh, so what we know, we know that it, when the pH is low, we form a helix and we get insertion. The aspartic acid groups are a key for the insertion event. Changing them can abolish it or alter the insertion pK, and other groups modulate cooperativity. Uh, not, not discussed. So we know, we know how to manipulate some of the properties of this peptide with respect to insertion across membranes. And then the question uh, for this group and for us, is how can we use these molecules for diagnosis or therapy? So we have three lines of work. One is imaging. We attach something, remember it was unidirectional insertion, so we attach something on the end that doesn't go through, and we use the partitioning energy that at low pH of putting this across the membrane uh, to locate that entity at the membrane in an acidic environment. The second idea is that we attach a molecule to the inserting end um, using a disulfide. And the disulfide, if this is a cell, once it gets inside the cell, the disulfide gets re reduced because there's the reducing environment in the cytoplasm. And 
the molecule, whatever it is, is released. So that's a delivery strategy. And then finally, uh, something I'm not going to speak of today except for this, uh, is the idea of using this uh, phenomenon to target either liposomes or nanoparticles uh, to cells in tumors. And we're beginning to work in that direction with our collaborators, and, and there are some promising observations there. So first, what about targeting tumors? So I've already shown you a couple of images. I'll show you one more here. So this is a, uh, a study with um, uh, putting, putting in uh, cell, cultivating cells that express GFP doesn't show up so well because the GFP fluorescence doesn't penetrate tissue very well. Uh, and here are the images using fluorescently labeled FLIP using one, an infrared dye. Actually, lately we've been preferring Alexa 750. The infrared penetrates tissue well, and so we can image it better uh, in a whole mouse. And so this is the same mouse progressively. And if we look at the contrast index, we see that it increases nicely. We use this K-flip that I mentioned before as a control that doesn't insert, nothing happens. Um, and if we add glucose just at the time of administration, just one shot, um, it enhances the uptake and development of the, uh, of the contrast index very nicely. Uh, we've begun in collaboration with Jason Lewis's lab uh, some experiments to look at uh, imaging using radioisotopes, and we'll probably do some, some work in that direction here as well. Um, and the, uh, here are a couple cell lines. One of, this is a more aggressive cell line, and you can see that the, the tumor imaging, uh, these are contrast indices here and here. Tumor imaging is better. Um, here's a, here's PC3 cells, and you can see still get some imaging. Um, tumor targeting correlates with tumor aggressiveness. So if you've got a tumor that is faster growing and more aggressive, then all those metabolic si signatures that we talked about will operate more forcefully. The Warburg effect, the uh, Pasteur effect, those things will uh, be enhanced in tumors that are made of cells that are growing more rapidly, more aggressively. And indeed, if we look at M4A4 cells, which are a metastatic line, the labeling is uh, much better than NM2C5 cells, which are not. Um, and here again, it's the contrast indices. So interestingly, we may be able to distinguish, to some extent, uh, the physiological state and degree of aggressiveness of a tumor using some imaging <laughs> strategy. Um, model tumors, as I, I'm sure everyone in this room knows better than I do, uh, in which you basically culture cells under the skin of a mouse, are not representative of a lot of aspects of real tumors, particularly cell heterogeneity and so on. Uh, so, but there are mice, uh, there are mouse lines. One of them is the tramp mouse, which is a, a, a mouse that gets a spontaneous prostate tumor. Uh, and here's a tramp mouse uh, labeled now by I, IP, injection of FLIP. Uh, uh, and uh, wait, wait, uh, you have to wait for uh, the background to subside. And then, um, open the mouse, and there is, there is the tumor. Uh, this mouse conveniently fell apart into all of its pieces. And, um, and when we looked at them, uh, we could see that there's significant accumulation in the kidneys, which is not surprising, because they're acidic. Um, and uh, here is the tumor. And when you take the tumor and cut it in half, you see that the labeling is throughout the tumor. And this is actually quite uh, exceptional because w many labeling strategies will, you'll see a halo here because the label won't get into the tumor. So somehow, and we don't know exactly how this works, uh, the flip exchanges its way into the body of the tumor. 
we've tried a couple of uh, models of metastases, one by implanting a metastatic line, letting it go metastatic, removing the primary tumor and then looking, and another by injecting cells into the blood of a mouse. Um, and indeed, both of them label well with FLIP, um, right down to the cellular level. And uh, <coughs> once again, we're using a line that has GFP expression, and so when you look at the cell level, you can see that the FLIP is kind of around the periphery of the cells and the GFP is in the cytoplasm, just as we would expect, given the labeling strategy. And uh, this, this dot is a metastasis that's smaller than two millimeters. And so what we find is that we can successfully target things as small as two millimeters or less. Uh, once again, comparing GFP uh, this is now opening, the, opening a mouse with a tumor. We compare the boundaries indicated by the fluorescence of uh, GFP with that from FLIP. They coincide. If we take out the tumor and leave little bits behind and zoom in on them, they the images still coincide, and this is a millimeter uh, size scale, so these are submillimeter little bits of tissue that can be successfully identified potentially open, opening the way to image-guided surgery. Um, so tumors are targeted. targeted. There is a, uh, a background in kidneys that we have to think about. Uh, aggressive tumors are better targeted. Small tumors can be targeted. Um, now, I'm pretty much out of time, but I just want to say that the, we've met, done some studies with model compounds to establish what we can deliver into a, into a mouse. Um, and uh, we put on, we put, have an attachment point, we vary the properties, and we detect by fluorescence. And here, here's delivery of two of those compounds into cells. Um, and the properties of those molecules are, are surprising. That is, they are quite polar. So a negative log P is a polar molecule. A negative log P of two is really quite polar, and these molecules would not get in on their own, leading us to think that we could deliver functional, tar functional molecules like peptide nucleic acids. Um, so here's delivery of a peptide nucleic acid in the same kind of experiment, putting a fluorescent label on the peptide nucleic acid, delivering it into a cell, zooming in, and you see it in the nucleus. And our colleagues, and we're doing some parallel work here, uh, our, our colleagues have done one experiment that I'll show you, although it's preliminary, um, with uh, Peter Nielsen. Uh, and this is a tumor grown from cells that uh, have a, uh, a splicing defect that can be corrected by a peptide nucleic acid, and it appears that it is when you inject FLIP uh, carrying a peptide nucleic acid. So FLIP can target and deliver molecules with no formal charges are a problem. Log P's quite polar, big, into a cell. So the overall conclusions are we can target uh, acidic tissues, including tumors. Cargo molecules can be delivered. Nanoparticles can be targeted. We didn't talk about that, but we've shown that nano gold can be, can be targeted to tumors in the same uh, way. Uh, so we have surface, surface targeting for imaging. We have the potential of delivery into the cytoplasm, and we have nanoparticle targeting. Uh, this, is an, this work has involved a lot of people, and on, on an ongoing basis, it will continue to do so. I just want to pick out uh, that Oleg Andreev and Jana Reshetniak are my close collaborators. Uh, we've been uh, lately beginning some very important collaborations here at Yale with the Bosenberg Lab, the Glazer Lab, the Saltzman Lab, and the SLAC Lab, and uh, we thank the YCC for facilitating this, and uh, we've, we've had a pilot grant, and we're, we're rolling. So I'm uh, very pleased to tell you this story, and I'm now open to questions.
question. It seems, to, it seems to work either way. Uh, IP is a slower delivery. Uh, takes, takes longer to find its way into the blood. Uh, we believe that the reason FLIP uh, can stay around as long as it does is that it rides on the, on the surfaces of the red blood cells. So the reason, if you inject a polar peptide into a mouse, it's usually gone in 10 minutes or less. Sorry? For metastasize. Uh, it might be that IP injection is better because it, it, it's essentially a sustained release strategy of some other kind. I'm not sure what, you're, I'm having trouble understanding what the question is. Oh, if we were going to use it, which would be the better route of administration? I'd say we don't know at this point. Yeah. Can you kill or can we target signal cells? Uh, is there a sufficient pH environment around a single tumor cell? For instance, uh, Metastasis presumably originates from a single cell, uh, but probably uh, from a single cell. Is there, I imagine that the pH is produced in a neighborhood of a uh, number of cells, but if you run a single cell, can you tell me that? It's a very interesting question to which we don't yet know the answer. Can we target single cells? Um, the, if you think about the pH at the surface of a cell, um, it depends in large measure on the delta pH across the membrane, which is part of the membrane potential. And because of the electrostatic potential, the delta pH will concentrate protons near the surface. So the pH at the surface where this peptide is binding is actually lower probably than the surrounding pH. So when you measure the external pH by NMR or by uh, probe method or whatever method you do, uh, the acidity it is not really the characteristic of the cell surface. Cell surfaces are more acidic than that, particularly cancer cells. So it's plausible that single cell targeting might, might work. Easy experiment to do. Very good. We're going to have to move on. Let's thank Don again.